about Paladin, a very curious um, character of the French occult revival, very severely neglected in most of the literature. So if I cover ground you're already aware of, forgive me, if because I'm sure some people will appreciate the background. Um, just to give you a little bit of an impression of the impact Paladin had during his lifetime, we're in the late uh, 19th century in Paris, and in the spring of 1892, one normal spring afternoon, the Paris police were suddenly shocked to see thousands of people and carriages going through the streets, causing a traffic jam, which for the time is a bit peculiar, uh, on their way to the Galerie du Rhin Riel. Now, on arrival there, they were met by a very curious bearded man in purple robes and the exhibition catalogue that they were handed greeting, greeted them with the lines, Artist, you are a priest. Art is the great mystery and if your effort results in a masterpiece, a ray of divinity will descend as if on an altar. Artist, you are a king. Art is the true empire. If your hand draws a perfect line, the cherubim themselves will descend to revel in their reflection. They may one day close the church, but what about the museum? If Notre Dame is profaned, the Louvre will officiate. Humanity will always go to mass if the priest is Bach, Beethoven, Palestrina. Brothers in all the arts, I am sounding a battle cry. Let us form a holy militia for the save salvation of idealism. We will build the temple of beauty, for the artist is a priest, a king, a mage. Art is a mystery, the great miracle. That's what caused the traffic jam. And this idea, this, this idea that Paladin was trying to communicate in every way possible, and it included through some major art exhibitions um, during the 1890s, was to somehow find a way to save, as he saw it, Western civilization from what he perceived as decadence, corruption, the modern age. The irony is, of course, that he himself, in his individualism, was very much a modernist, but he doesn't need to know that. Um, so, over his lifetime, despite being pretty much forgotten today, Paladin produced over a hundred books, many of which were novels, many of which were theoretical, esoteric tracts, um, several theatrical plays, many of which were actually produced, and these six salons, as well as writing in newspapers, all of this was tuned to trying to convince anybody who would listen, really, that art, symbolic art, that communicated the message that life is far more than life in matter, communicating his esoteric message, um, and it, and that the per, that was that that was its purpose in order to try to convince people from all walks of life, and that's one of the reasons why he used such a wide spread of well, media, if you like, the media of the day. Now. What was this message? Why art? What was he actually trying to say with this all? It all sounds a bit peculiar. So far, you might, you might be able to see why he was actually perceived as an eccentric, um, especially the purple robes. Well, I don't know how well you can see this particular slide um, but from where you're sitting, but I'll, I'll try to walk through it briskly. Um, all, everything that Paladin tried to do rested on the premise that on, on the premise that mankind had to be their own saviour. And not only that, but that in becoming their own saviour, mankind had to right the wrong created by the fall, the fall of angels and of mankind. Um, now, there's a lot more I could say about the fallen angels, but there won't be time today. Um, suffice it to say that he believes that both humans and the fallen angels needed to re redeem themselves and each other, and the only way that this could be achieved was through humans becoming creators in and of themselves. So at the heart of, the, of his mythology is this concept, this theory, 
and how he arrived at it is a whole other conversation, is this concept that humanity was created by angels, the angels fell in love with their creation, tried to communicate the divine mysteries to their creation, and that was simply not possible. It contravened natural law as Peladan conceives and explains it. Um, this caused the fall, this caused the rupture of the primordial androgyne and the creation of Adam and Eve in mortal form. From that moment, says Paladin, evil entered the world and that is when this process of needing to seek redemption began. The angels were also cast down, but not because they were cursed, they were, but as a, in, their punishment was to guide humanity through the centuries to an understanding of their divine origins. So you have to imagine in this, in this mythology of Paladins, you have to imagine humanity as basically lost children. That's how they're portrayed, and that's gradually, gradually, their consciousness would be raised until they could become creators the themselves. teachers, all the demigods, all the guides of mankind that we get in world mythology through the eons, um, they are all, in fact, fallen angels in human form. So uh, figures like Hercules, figures like um, the deities of basically any of the ancient religions, they are actually, says Paladin, ancient, um, they are actually fallen angels, and their teachings have been codified in the art of the ancient civilizations. And that is where, he says, art, that is where the magic of art lies, in its ability to codify in symbolic form these teachings from a higher realm. Um, and this is how art becomes an intermediary. Now, his perception was, his, his concept was, that by coming into contact with art, that like the kind of, like temple art in Egyptian, um, in Egyptian temples, like uh, the art, uh, the, like ancient Greek art on, again, on, in the friezes um, that, we're, that we're all familiar with, like three-dimensional, he called them hieroglyphs, like the Sphinx or the winged bull of Babylon, he believed um, that by coming into contact with art of this sort, gradually, or, or suddenly, sometimes just through a flash of uh, insight, one could reach an understanding of our divine origins and what we're doing here. So, when humanity reached a point of understanding all of this, that's when reunification with the divine could finally take place. And um, to do this, Paladin not only advised anybody who would listen, basically, and especially his artists, the artists in his circle, to try to flood the world with art that did communicate something like this. But he also created a very, very curious system for self-initiation, because he believed that the only way to resolve the, um, the um, well, the breaking of the primordial androgyne was for both men and women each with their own attributes, to reach a certain uh, level of awareness, and only then could they come together and fully reunite. So his system of self-initiation, which is um, what I'll be talking about um, mostly this evening, is something designed to help people sort of drop the scales from their eyes and see this message um, that Peladon wanted them to see. Um, you're not going to be able to see this, but if anybody is interested, they can look at it later. He perceived humanity as belonging within a very specific hierarchy of being. So at the, t so at the top, he's basically got God, the angels and Lucifer, and this whole creation story of his. Again, in his mythology, the children of the angels intermingled, intermarried with humanity. So in Paladin's worldview, artists, authors, the great philosophers of the past, and so on, are actually descended from these fallen angels, from these daemons, as he calls them. And for him, they are the ones that need to lead this sort of battle, in, his ba in sounding his battle cry, they need to lead the way in communicating this message through their art, or whichever art that might be, um, 
visual or anything else. And below, beneath, below them he has the rest of humanity who are still on their way to awakening. And the, the rest of humanity he separates into a variety of categories. He has people he perceives as initiates who have already awoken and understand this concept and are actively perhaps working towards helping others with it. He has a category he calls the animique. And this is the category he's most interested in. People with all the potential for awakening, but who aren't quite there yet. They need a little bit of a nudge, they need a little bit of help. But this was the category that he believed had the potential um, to join the initiates. Below them he has what he calls the mob. This is very platonic, by the way. Most of Pal Paladin's theory is based on platonic philosophy, um, just with a different spin. And, um, the, and the mob, as he calls them, they are people who are not interested or not able or not ready to come anywhere near this ki these kinds of ideas. So ret returning to the animique, he then goes into a whole lot of subcategories based on as astrological signs, different planetary influences, and he actually has a very, very detailed outline of the different ways in which people should try to approach this process of awakening depending on their particular attributes. So if you're more of a Leo, you're more of a Scorpio, there are different sort of approaches to this kind of thing. Again, I'm not sure how well you can see this. It's a painting by a uh, Dutch artist, Jan Turop. And what you have is a sphinx um, being carried or uh, laying on the top of a series of bent figures. Behind it, you've got a series of figures who are as it, uh, look as if they're in celebration, look as if they're around. You've got figures who sort of look a bit more ethereal, like they're on their way somewhere, their eyes are closed and they're traveling. Now, this is how Turup was one of um, Peladan's circle, and this is how he explains it. They ha who are completely caught under the Sphinx's claws are unevolved beings. That's, the, that's his mob. In the center of the painting, man and woman struggling towards ever higher evolution are chained to Earth. These are the ensouled, the animique. They're still, they're trying to get there, but they're not there yet. To the right, those who have freed themselves from the Sphinx's claws and who therefore constitute the driving force of all spiritual labor. And those are the initiates. So this, is one, this painting, I think, sums it all up very beautifully. Um, and whether or not, uh, we're not, I'm not going to, even going to go near <laughs> what kind of sort of social co concepts this is standing on, but okay, 19th century. Um, it's this whole idea of how can we awaken more people, people who are ready to see more things, but whose reality perhaps is, especially remember, I'll say it again, 19th century, within a society governed by all sorts of rules and codes of conduct. Peladan was not a great friend of social rules, by the way. Um, so his whole initiatory system is based on the idea of erase, he actually uses the phrase erase society's strictures. You're going to have to go off grid if you want to do this right. That's basically what he says. And I think that may not be so true today, although I guess in some places it is. So, what's his initiatory system all about? For him, magic was becoming what it, the best one possibly could become. So when asked about magic, he said, and the, the initiatory powers conferred by this system of his, he said, seek no other measure of magical power than that of your internal power. Do not judge another being except by the light they emit, or don't emit, I would add to perfect yourself by becoming luminous and like the sun to warm the latent ideal life around you. So get there yourself and like the sun, just transmit that to the people next to you. Do that, they'll get to the people next to them. And that's how he sort of, his grand vision works. He thought, well, if I can get to a few, that can sort of um, increase exponentially. Didn't work, but it was a nice idea. Um, 
This, he says, is the whole mystery of initiation. So for him, this, initi this was the ultimate purpose of this initiatory system. And contrary to most initiatory systems, Peladans was out in the open. Secrecy for him was absolutely pointless. This was something that had to be shared. And this is why you get newspapers of the time, Rosqua Salon, and Peladan sort of holding court, uh, writing reams in the newspaper, trying to communicate this. Um, it's pretty surreal, and it explains why eventually he was written off as an eccentric. But, in fact, there's a very peculiar cohesion and coherence to his system. Um, okay, these are more definitions of magic, which I won't um, tie you with, but um, the essence is this. He says, before you can even think and choose, society shapes you to its rules. You have three destinies, and this was aimed at young men. He has different, different messages for young women. Um, you have three destinies. You can be an animal, a savage, an animique, like everybody else, or a spiritual man like St. Saint, Saint Thomas or Dante. And these were some of his sort of saints, as far as he was concerned. As an animal, if you're going to be an animal, if you're going to be part of the mob, he says, be beautiful. <laughs> That's quite a message. As an animique, be good. Seek the grail. I cannot give you the philosopher's stone. I can only emancipate you from instinct and society. Now, Peladan wrote three initiatory handbooks. One for young men, one for young women. I say young, but uh, it seems as if he's writing for younger people. Perhaps because he believed they were still malleable, they were still open to change. Maybe he does often write, um, and you, young man, for example, in one of them. So one for men, one for women, and one for artists. Now, for artists, they got their marching orders about what they needed to do and why they needed to do it, and they needed to be in the service of the angels. That's artists taken care of. For young men, he came up with an incredibly complex system. I'm not going to read through this. If anybody would like the PowerPoint afterwards, just drop me an email. It's, uh, I'm happy to share it. Um, now, it had seven levels or degrees. Each degree had a mystery, a virtue, a gift, a beatitude, a duty, a guardian angel, an arcanum, a secret teaching, and he also associates it with Assyrian and modern astrology governing this particular level of consciousness. And he wrote, a, and this particular book, How to Become a Mage, it's called, is divided into seven, covering the seven degrees, and then a further 12 subcategories according to both Assyrian, um, the Assyrian pantheon, uh, planetary correspondences, and Kabbalistic correspondences. He has thought of everything. It's all in there. Hugely complex, but uh, also very curious to see that in the end what he's saying is let go of what society is telling you to become and look at yourself and see what you can, what can you really become, and then sort of how begin to implement that implement that in your own life now how to implement that he called kaloprosopia kaloprosopia is a made up word it's his word it's from the greek kalos which means good and prosopo which means face or person and basically um the best way i can sum this up is fake it till you make it that's actually what it meant he said, make the acts of faith and, and the faith will come, quoting. Uh, I think it's St. Thomas Aquinas. So, um, or is it, no, it's Augustine, not St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, what did he mean by this? And this explains why he went around wearing purple robes and why he went around calling himself Sa, uh, Sa Merodac or um, the Prince Merodac. It was because, he said, if, even if you don't feel it, you don't have the confidence, you're not sure about it, you don't, it doesn't feel real to you yet, if you begin to enact the role of the person you want to become, of the initiate you want to be, and you try to implement that in all your behaviours and in your looks, and you treat your life and your appearance, every aspect of your life, as if it's a painting you're creating, as if it's a play you're, you're acting in all the time, sooner or later that becomes internalized 
And that's when you know it's become real. That's when you know it's become yours. So for each of the initiatory steps and um, degrees that he proposes, he um, gave very, very detailed instructions how to deal with various social situations, all the way down to food. First thing he says is give up smoking, don't go to cafeterias and don't read newspapers. That's one of the first things he says. I agree about the newspapers. Um, yes, and, and so, so that's, that's the essence of it. It's the essence of first you need to cast away the trappings of society and then you need to at least act like you mean it. Eventually it will become a reality to you. As for the ladies, because that was for the men, as for the ladies, um, Peladan has earned himself um, a reputation as a misogynist, which is actually based on a misperception. He was not. Um, what he dis disliked intensely and does rail against, but people need to have often taken that out of context, is what polite society of his day had made women become. If I just go back to that slide, um, you know, you've got a lady in a very tight corset chained to a dressmaker's dummy. And behind her, you've got a Medusa, sort of the dark, the wild feminine, howling because the woman cannot be everything she is meant to be. So this kind of uh, encapsulates this particular message. And as he says here, from boarding school where spontaneity is reprimanded to the salon where, again, games of wordplay and double meanings are forbidden to her, the modern woman obeys negative commandments. So basically he hated what women had been turned into by this, these kind of social rules. To wait, to refuse, to retreat and to be silent, there is the entire expected behaviour. Well, um, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, polite French society, probably true. It's still true in some societies today. Um, society, which is more selfish than anyone because it is made of general selfishness, overwrites the individualism of souls as if with a state decree. Now for ladies, he didn't have such a graduated, such a carefully structured system because he believed that men and women had different faculties, different attributes and needed to approach this differently. But for women, he believed they needed to look into the most powerful female archetypes of the past and he said that women would be either princesses, by which he meant warrior princesses, not princesses in the town, not little girl princesses, with too much pink. So, uh, and he gave, held up examples of um, women warriors of the past, Amazons, queens of, um, in antiquity, um, or what he called fae, fairies, by which he meant muses. Though the women who would quietly and gently, who did have a, some, a stronger connection perhaps to the spiritual world and who could use that to inspire and to touch others. And then of course there were the women who would never be able to break the societal strictures and who belonged to the mob and who they, they were the ones he railed against and that's why he got a bad name for it. So those basically were the more practical solutions that Paladin offered for people who had understood there was somewhere to go with this idea, who, had, who felt that there was something they wanted to do with it, and his advice for um, how to, how to um, approach it, and he did it himself. Now, of course, by doing it himself, he earned himself a terrible name. Um, he was ridiculed during his lifetime, despite being so prolific, despite being extremely influential as well across the border um, and, and outside France and as far as Latin America and Russia, in fact, his influence reached before and after his death. Um, but esotericists, his fellow esotericists did sort of uh, ridicule him and um, buried his work sometimes also appropriating parts of it for themselves uh, in the process. I've been able to document that as well. Um, so, you know, here we are a hundred and something years later wondering, well, why do we need to know about Peladan and why do we care anyway, apart from the sort of academic, historical sort of side of things? Well, just like Peladan's time, where he was um, early 20th, um, less and less so um, a, a pro in the build-up to World War One. Just like then, then as now, 
was a period of uncertainty, of flux, of uh, change, of not quite sure where we're going, but we're going wrong some places. Um, very similar period to today. Um, some historians would probably agree that a lot of the issues, at least in the Western world, um, that we're facing today, politically, ge um, geopolitically, socially, are issues that have been problems since before World War I. We haven't solved them yet. And for the la best part of the last century, they are still plaguing us and the repercussions are still here. What did Paladin and his circle do back then? They looked to the past for solutions. They went back and they tried to reinterpret the past. They tried to look for answers before, in their minds, things went wrong. A lot of people are doing the same thing now. Suddenly, interestingly, this period of history is becoming, and especially the esoteric goings on during this period of history, are becoming increasingly sort of popular. People are looking at them again, and I think it's for the same reason. My belief is, um, it's for this, uh, as an esoteric historian, <laughs> my belief is it's for the same reason. Um, looking for something we missed last time round, looking for something that might have fallen through the cracks. And then there's the question of the art. Can art practically really offer us something? I mean, I'm sure we can speak about this on a spiritual, esoteric level, but on a very practical level, I would say it's something, art is something that bypasses the um, logic, common sense. It's something that speaks deeper. It's a place where we can explore, we can experiment, we can put something, uh, we can look in a mirror using art as a society, not just artists, not just artists, but as a society, as a culture, as individuals and as communities. So uh, Paladin's um, emphasis on art was for a very specific purpose. But art that actually tells stories, art with a message, art with a meaning, and we've had far too little of that as a sort of abstract art has uh, gone through its uh, popularity phase. Perhaps there's something more to be said there for art that can be talismanic, that can say more, that can become something to work with and to get, enter into a uh, dialogue with. Um, Paladin's Caloprosopia, well, fake it till you make it, that's nothing uh, esoteric, that's nothing mystical, but it's also something that works, and everybody who's ever suffered from uh, stage fright or imposter syndrome will know that. So anyone who's ever gone through a job interview will know that. So um, is there any point in looking back at his system? Well, it's a very interesting series of steps. It has a lot of interesting things to say about the way society acts on us. Um, as an individual, I pride myself on still being a nonconformist, yet I was surprised reading Paladin to notice his observations of often insidious ways in which society can sort of, yes, grind us down. It's worth being conscious of that. It's worth remembering that if we want to be true to something deeper in ourselves, because the daily grind really can get you down. I think you all know that, especially if you live in a big city. Um, so that's another thing. Is there more? Is Paladin's aesthetic, is his way of um, speaking about this something we can get something from? And yes, I come back to art as a tool for transformation on numerous levels. And it's also worth revisiting the art of that period and seeing how powerful was it really? Because actually it did have quite a lot of influence. It's just it, that never made it into the history books because the art historians didn't really like, didn't really know what to do with it. And I've got a story I can't tell you about that, a very current story I can't tell you about that. But the fact is, art has always been a method for a culture, for a society to re-examine itself. And at least on that uh, note, I think Feladan has something more to say to us. So I think that is more or less it. I've probably gone horrendously over time because uh, Aiton's looking nervously at his <laughs> phone. Um, so, um, so the que yes, the question is, can art lie just as other media can lie? The thing is, you see, in art there are no words. And art is governed by certain rules like, um, you know, there is, such, there is such a thing as bad art. So if I don't think it's possible to create, let's say, a painting um, with a lie in it that actually looks good, if that makes any sense. Because if you've got, um, you know, OK, so something like there is uh, paradise after death. OK, now, 
automatically your intellect's going to kick in and say, okay, we don't know that. It's, it's something that makes me feel good or doesn't. It communicates to the senses. It communicates somewhere deeper. It does not communicate to the intellect. It does not communicate in words. So if it has a message to give beyond words um, that is not true, well, it's not true to me, it's not true to you, but it might be true to the next person. That's, uh, and that's so it, uh, it, because art is based on subjectivity anyway. So can it lie? Not really. I don't think it can. The media, on the other hand, well, I think we all need to pay more attention to quite what we hear in the media. Again, the question is um, Pella Dan in relation to modernism and why symbolism as an influence on modernism um, isn't often included. This is a very peculiar omission on the part of the art historians. Um, it's beginning to change. It is beginning to change, and I've actually been part of research groups and conferences where we've been talking about precisely this question. Um, symbolism is notoriously difficult to define, and it's notoriously difficult to pin down and explain and describe. And one of the best recent books I've seen that tries to do that and sort of fix this, or be begin to fix it even, uh, by Michelle Fagos, uh, the, I think it's just called The Art of Symbol. I don't remember the title now, um, it says exactly this, that we've got to end up by describing it, and then once we've got a ha sort of handle on what symbolism is, it's art that tells a story, basically, then try to look at its place in the history. Um, I have Peladan down as a modernist um, par excellence because even though he wouldn't have identified that way, um, he was riding the sort of tail of um, the sort of struggle between the old regime and staring modernism in the face. The fact that he was an individualist, the fact that he called for individualism and individual self-determination and self well, individuation is a Jungian term which comes later, but that's what he was calling for. That makes it, and that, no, I'm going to do this my way and not the traditional way, even though he, so he reinterpreted tradition in a completely modern way. So you have to call him a modernist, you can't call him anything else. So when will this actually reach the mainstream? Already in academic circles, I mean, we are talking about this. When is that going to filter down into mainstream academia, because esoteric academia is, well, something special? Slowly. So they still don't want to listen. A lot of the time, these disciplinary boundaries don't want to listen to each other. People don't want to listen to scholars on the other side of the wall. We'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> the question is his use of various media and um, art as performance. Well, I, didn't, I haven't talked a lot about his theatre, which, which one day I really need to do a talk just on his theatre. Um, I mean, you know, we know sort of ritual theatre from Alistair Crowley. We know uh, ritual theatre from other... Uh, esoteric figures, but Peladan's ritual theatre is very, very interesting. It's got weird influences from Greek uh, classical uh, theatre. You've got a chorus, you've got gods on stage. Every, uh, every uh, character is a symbol and the audience is included. Some, some of the plays are almost like initiation ceremonies involving the audience, only the audience doesn't know until it's too late, until you've woken them up by force because they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. So yes, absolutely, that was part of it. Um, and his, his use of every media available to him uh, was very deliberate. If he'd been, if he was around today, I think his Twitter would be on fire. I mean, <laughs> the guy could not stop to talking, and every single medium he could find, he used. So. The question is, um, what Peladan's feelings might be about, well, the anima animus um, sort of model, and um, also me uh, mentioning Greek philosophy. Well, his whole theory is based on Platonism. Okay, it's pure Platonism, with esoteric and um, a few drops of Catholic thought on top but really it's Platonism dressed up so yes Plato's Symposium and the splitting of the androgyne there it's, it, Peladan acknowledges it's the same story he speaks of the fall of Lucifer and he says well it's just the story of Prometheus isn't it with different words he says this and he actually goes to Greek myth to confirm his theories so if you can find it in Greek myth or in Plato for him that's a confirmation end of, I'm right. So as far as the splitting of the androgyne and the two um, genders for him, and this is a whole, again, other lecture <laughs> for another day perhaps, 
w he believed that when the androgyne was split, men and women got different faculties. Um, men got intellect and spirit, women got volition and instinct. And so they were not the same, but they were both equally critical to sort of uh, to um, the, this reunification process. But this is why he believed they had to go at it different ways. Now, that's not to say women don't have an intellect, <laughs> but it, this is his oh, this is his theological explanation for what happened and for what how he explained everything else. I don't know if that covers your question. No, that's perfect. Okay, you you're very welcome. I do multiple projects, I do too much stuff. Okay, I've um, been researching Paladin for several years as my PhD um, work. My doctoral thesis was on, was a full scale review of who he, he was, what he did. So, from a historicist and literary viewpoint. Um, that's how I came at Paladin, but I'm also an artist. I was an artist before I, I did all the academic stuff. So. Now that I'm done with a PhD, now that I'm doing other stuff, um, I really wanted to create an art series that illustrated his ideas. And I got the opportunity to do that for a conference that's happening at the end of the week in Northampton, University of Northampton. There's a group exhibition as well as a conference. So I created this art series for that. And what I've done is each image, it's a series of uh, 17 images in here, um, each image is based on a quote from Peladan and an explanation of basically what he had to say. So I've got his creation theory in here. I've got his three ways to reach God, sort of as illustrations. It's my visualization, uh, the way I thought I could put it into an image of his sort of message, if you like. Um, brief article in the front about Peladan, just to give some background, is basically a lot of what I've said today. Um, but condensed a word on symbolist art and how my take on it so that folks don't read more into this than they should, basically. Uh, don't attribute to me stuff I haven't put there. Um, and yeah, and basically quotes and explanations um, of the images. Um, so to try to illustrate basically his message, it's the narrative of his message, it's the exhibition catalogue for my exhibit. Um, there are a few copies in store, I believe, yes, and if they run out, um, my email's in the back or you can Google my name, basically, and um, I, I have very few copies left, but there will be more, so you can get it at Watkins or from me. <laughs>